us to give us guidance and tell of his unconditional love for us. It's such a special book that to keep it nice, you shouldn't open it. I recommend keeping it in the original box and putting it safely away in the back of a closet somewhere. God didn't give us his word so we could get it dirty. Now it is important to study the Bible, so look at the cover. What color is it? Also, study the binding. What condition is it in? These things will affect the value of the book. If kept in mint condition, the Bible could be the most valuable book you own. These have been Deep Thoughts from a Shallow Christian. So I'm glad some of you actually laughed at that. Um, maybe you've watched Saturday Night Live in the past, but you know kind of where that comes from in, in that case. But that's what we're going to be talking about uh, today as we begin this new sermon series. But before we get there, let's actually open up the Bible. Luke chapter 24. Uh, this was Easter Sunday. Jesus rises from the dead. His disciples don't know what's going on at this time. And then he's on this road with them, walking, shows up. They don't recognize him. They're doing this walk to Emmaus, a, a three, four-hour walk. And he says, Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, all that the Old Testament has spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory, that the Christ should be crucified? And then beginning with Moses, so the beginning of the Old Testament, all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. And I love that the disciples were hospitable to the stranger, right? Because that's what disciples do. They, they love people. And so they invite him to stay with them because it was a long journey. But then it says as they're eating, when he was at the table with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And then all of a sudden their eyes were opened and they recognized him. They recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. And then they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road while he opened to us the scriptures. Right. Simply put, is where we're going to be going with this sermon series that we are now in. It's going to take us through the month of May. Uh, in case you don't know me, I'm Pastor Justin Krupski. It's great to, to lead this series for us. I'm going to be up the next couple weeks too, and then Pastor Chris and Pastor Lou will be part of this. But over the last eight weeks or so, we here at Trinity have been asking you all, what questions do you have? What are you wrestling with in your faith? Or what are those around you wrestling with and how can we empower you to be able to answer those questions and the hope is that we can keep it simple we can keep it simple because things get so complex so often but there are a lot of questions asked in this first big grouping today is not necessarily going to be on the bible as a whole but specifically there are a lot of questions about the old testament part of the bible Right, the first 39 books of the Bible that cover over 4,000 plus years of history that are written by 30 plus different authors. Books that are historical, books that tell a timeline. Books that are poetic, books in offering wisdom and songs. And books that are prophetic in that there are prophets speaking to the people in the history line about what was happening and what was going to happen for them. Our hope today, specifically, is that your faith is going to be strengthened uh, and that you're going to be able to defend your faith even more when people ask tough questions. But even more than that, if we could walk away with something, that you and I will feel more value towards the Old Testament and actually open it up uh, outside of just when we're here together as a community. And so the big question is this, is what's up with the Old Testament and specifically, the first question that we're going to address is this. Am I really supposed to believe the stories? Am I really supposed to believe the stories actually are true from the Old Testament? A lot of times when people are wrestling with the faith, they wrestle with these stories in the Old Testament. Right? Did God really create the world in six days? Am I really supposed to believe that? Am I really supposed to believe that there's this worldwide flood where eight people were saved and all nations came from them? Am I really supposed to believe that donkeys actually talked in the Old Testament? Am I really supposed to believe that a big fish swallowed somebody and spit them out? Am I really supposed to believe that a group of people walked around the city and just by them marching around the city, the walls collapsed? Am I really supposed to believe this stuff? And so to keep it simple, to answer that question, 
Our faith is not based on that stuff. Our faith is based on what we celebrated last weekend as a community here. Jesus rose again from the dead. And if Jesus rose again from the dead, let's keep it this simple. If Jesus rose again from the dead, I'm going to listen to what he has to say. And if Jesus rose again from the dead, all that stuff is possible. It's possible. And I'm not going to get into arguments about all this stuff and let this stuff rat on my faith because this is the point. This is the foundation. Jesus rose again from the dead. And if he rose again from the dead, then guess what? Not only are we going to listen to him, but everything is possible then. Because people don't rise from the dead. But he rose again from the dead. That's the center point of the scriptures. And so another question, moving forward, simply put, is did Jesus read the Old Testament? What did Jesus think about the Old Testament? This guy who rose again from the dead, what did he think about the Old Testament? And so we have four different accounts of his life that history has, has passed down to us that we believe are, are true accounts, that we have the original accounts. And in these four different accounts, we have three years of Jesus' life um, exposed for us. But out of those three years, you start doing the math, all right, that's a thousand days, and you actually look at these four writings that we call Gospels, only 30 days of his adult life of those three years is actually recorded, which is a very small percentage. But in those 30 days, what's recorded for us in these gospel accounts, Jesus actually quotes the Old Testament over 80 times. So the question is, did Jesus read the Old Testament? What did Jesus think about the Old Testament? Absolutely yes, right? And what we know about Jesus' teaching is not just was he quoting it, but he would say, here's what it said, let me clarify this. Let me preach a sermon on this verse on this story. Let me help you understand this story. Let me shed some light on it. Right? And so Jesus read the Old Testament. If we say we're disciples of Jesus, what do we do? We walk as Jesus walked. Right? And then the question is, is what did the first disciples think about the Old Testament? Right? And so what did the first disciples think about the Old Testament? We have this New Testament, which there weren't a lot of questions on, but we're going to use that to help us answer Old Testament. Right? And so we have 23 other books outside of just those four Gospels, these four stories about Jesus, these four sermons about Jesus. And in those 23 other books, over 700 times do they refer to the Old Testament. Do they quote the Old Testament? And so maybe this is too simple, but what did the disciples think about the Old Testament? Right? Apparently they had a high value, a high regard if they're quoting it, if they're referring to it, if they're expanding on it. Right? Second Timothy, we get a little bit of a, a glimpse here. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. So this is a man named Paul, right, writing to a young man named Timothy. And he says this in his writing, From childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. So he's not talking about the New Testament. He's talking about the Old Testament. You've been acquainted with them. He says this, They're able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Right? Timothy, you don't need the four Gospels. You don't need the New Testament. You just need these old school sacred writings, this Old Testament. They're going to make you wise to salvation and Jesus, Timothy. Timothy, remember that, that story of Jesus walking on the road to Emmaus with his disciples and how he opened it up and he just showed them everything? Timothy, there's over 400 times in the Old Testament that it talks about the Messiah, the one who was to come. Jesus fulfilled all these promises, all these prophecies, all these allusions to the, the future Messiah. Jesus did that over 400 times. Timothy, you know it. And then he says this about the Old Testament. All Scripture is breathed out by God. He's talking about the Old Testament. It's breathed out by God. The Holy Spirit somehow used these men and these women to write down these words. It was actually breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So Jesus valued the Old Testament. The first disciples valued the Old Testament. And the next question is this, or actually it was more of a statement. I don't like God in the Old Testament. I don't like God in the Old Testament. I'm just going to read the New Testament because right, they view God as a God of wrath in the Old Testament and a God of grace and love in the New Testament. And so I'm not going to read those 39 books. Right? God just, I don't like God in the Old Testament. And so the question would be is, is there still wrath if that's the God that we don't like? Does that show up in the New Testament? And I think we need to ask Jesus, Jesus, did God's wrath still happen in the New Testament? And so we go to Romans, right? Easter happened, but before that Jesus was crucified. 
And Paul says this God presented him, that's Jesus, as the one who would turn aside his wrath. That's the Father's wrath. Right? We're Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right? Taking away sin through faith in his blood. And so Jesus received the wrath of God. Right? Thank God for that moment that took place. Our punishment, our discipline, and our place. Right? God had to deal, because God is a God of justice, he needed to deal with sin because he cannot not deal with it. And he dealt with it. But then, the question is, right, so that happened to Jesus, thank you Jesus, but does that still happen to us? Do we still need to have a holy fear, a holy reverence for God? Does God still act the way that he acted in the Old Testament and the New Testament? And so, you read the book of Acts, right? you see a specific married couple, Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. Some of us know this story, but there's tithing going on, there's offering going on, and they decide to hold back, and they just don't decide to hold back, they decide to lie about it, and what happens to them? Right? God kills them on the spot. Right? Is it good to have a holy reverence for God? Yeah. Yeah. You read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, you read 1 Corinthians, the whole book, you read the book of Hebrews, right? The first disciples still saw God as a, a reverent God that we don't want to mess with God. Yeah, we don't want to mess with him. Right? That wasn't just in the Old Testament, that's also in the, the New Testament. So the next question, we're going to skip a question up in, in the media room. The next question is this. And actually, there's a lot of questions asked, and we're going to be doing an online Bible study that's going to seek to answer a lot of questions that you've asked, so it's okay that I just skip the question. That will be brought up in some future uh, podcast. Um, but the question is this, right? There's that one just centered on wrath, but where's the gospel? Is there gospel? Is there grace in the Old Testament? Because it seems like right, the New Testament is all about grace and gospel. It seems like the Old Testament, and some of us have perhaps learned this in the past, like it's the law and the New Testament is the gospel. Is that really what's going on there? Is there gospel in the Old Testament? And I'll start with this. If you want to look in your concordance in the back of your Bible or, or Google or ask Siri, does grace show up in the Old Testament? How many times does the word grace or gracious show up? Because it seems like it shows up a lot in the New Testament. She'll come back or Google will come back or your concordance will say, right, depending on which translation, but in the original language, it's about 15 to 20. And in the New Testament, it's actually about 15 or 20 times. And so, in fact, the Old Testament and the New Testament actually have the word grace show up right around the same time. But then when you start thinking about it, right, the gospel in the Old Testament was this, and God in his Ten Commandments actually starts them out with this. The first one is this, remember, remember, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Remember the gospel. Remember, I am a God of grace. You did nothing to earn that. You didn't do something. I'm the one who actually came and rescued you. I came and rescued you. Remember that. Remember that. Remember the gospel. And then when you look at the Old Testament, you can't help but see that God continues to show favor and mercy and grace. In fact, in Psalm 103, verse 8, this is just one of the verses that proclaim that God is a God of grace in the Old Testament. It says, the Lord is compassionate and gracious. slow to anger, abounding in love. But somehow, some way, you and I just don't get confused in that, but even the people of old were confused in that. But yet God was a God of grace. Not just in Jesus, but before Jesus. Another question is this is, did God love the whole world in the Old Testament? Because it seems like the Old Testament, he's just centered in on, on Israel. And if I'm going to read the book, the Bible, I'm going to read the New Testament because that pertains to me. The Old Testament doesn't pertain to me. And so, right, when you start reading the Old Testament, you see, right, first of all, that God created the whole world, that the whole world is his. And all of a sudden, as the story begins to unfold, he has this man, Abraham, because he wants the whole world to know him. And so he has a specific strategy. He says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you and your descendants so that you bless the whole world. Abraham, your descendants, you, are going to be a light into the world. You're going to be the priesthood for everybody because God loves everybody. And even we go back to 
the Exodus account, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, when you read that account, guess what? All nations came out of Egypt. It actually says that if you read the Old Testament, it wasn't just Israelites coming out of Egypt out of slavery. The whole world was coming out of slavery. Egypt was not just after the Israelites. They were after everybody. And it, the whole world comes out. The whole world is freed from the bondage. And Gentiles actually believed in Yahweh when you start reading through the Old Testament, and God's heart is for the whole world, you actually see this in the prophets. The prophets actually speak. Go back to Jonah and the big fish. Right? Who's Jonah's message for? Who's God sending him to? He's not sending him to Israel. He's sending Israel to Assyria. Right? To Assyria to say God is a gracious God. And what do they do when they hear the gospel message? They change their way of thinking, they repent, and guess what? They believe. And those are just a few instances, but if you start unpacking the Old Testament, you see how much God's heart is, and His heart for Israel is that you would actually make a difference. And if you're not going to make a difference, if you're not going to transform the world, I'm going to put you into the world so that the world can actually rub shoulders with you. Right? Stop getting in this bubble. It's not about you. I'm centering in on you so that you will let the whole world know that it's all about them. But how easy it was for them and how easy it is for us to forget that. So the last question we'll tackle uh, today in this moment, uh, what do we mean by Old Testament and New Testament? And this can be very complex, but an effort to keep it simple. I'll just say this. In the book of Colossians, Paul uh, sheds light on this. I encourage you to read Hebrews chapter 8. It really sheds light on this, and certainly a lot of the New Testament does but Colossians chapter 2, verse 17 says that everything that happened in the past, the old, right, was a shadow, a shadow of what is to come. The reality is found in Jesus, and so you and I have Jesus. Right? If it wasn't clear before, it's clear now. It's clear now. We have Jesus, the once for all sacrifice for our sins, the one that shows us, yes, God does love the whole world. Yes, God is a God of justice, of truth. And he's also a God of grace. Right? Jesus. So what's up with the Old Testament? Right? In Romans, Paul says this, because apparently people were all wrestling with this. It's not just us. Right. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. Right. Former days, he's talking about the Old Testament, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scripture, and so to see what unfolded for 4,000 years, the endurance and the encouragement that we might have hope. Hope. And there's a man that said this to Jesus, I believe, help me with my unbelief. We talked about Thomas last week uh, together. Right? Thomas said, I'm not going to believe unless they see his scars. And what does Jesus do? He shows up and says, Thomas, believe. Believe. Right? We believe, help us with our unbelief. Right? And I want to make sure we don't miss this historical fact as we talk about the Old Testament. Um, the church, and this might shake you, we'll see how you receive this. Uh, but the church was not built on the Bible. Right? The church was not built on the Bible. There were those that thought this was true, right? specifically Roman emperors who were persecuting the church, the movement of Jesus. And so what did they do? They took the book from them and burned it, thinking that it would stop the movement. And I love it because Christians didn't fight against that. They just said, all right, take the book. Take the book. We know we're not built on the book. We know that where the book has a place in our lives and in our faith, but we don't need this to move forward. Go ahead. Burn it. Right? I love it that what we know to be true is that the church exponentially grew during that time because the church knew what it was about. They had their foundation clear. Right? And so the question is, well, what are we built on? I don't know if we have any 8th graders in the gym right now. We did some confirmation interviews this past week, and so we asked this question, right? What is the gospel? Right? We're built on the gospel. What is the gospel? 
And all the confirmands this past week said the gospel is not about what we're doing, it's about what he's done. It's about what's done. Well, clarify that for me, eighth grader, if you want to be confirmed. Right? Well, he was crucified and he rose from the dead. That's what was done for me. And not just for me, but the whole world. That's the gospel. That's what the church is built on. Jesus Christ was crucified and he rose again from the dead. The Apostle Paul, at the end of the book of Acts, he's being confronted with uh, kings that don't believe and they're trying to get from him what it is that he believes, why there's this dispute. And he just says, listen, all I know is he's risen from the dead. I don't know what else to tell you. I can't deny that. It starts here and it ends here. The gospel. And the church understood that. But yet the church also understood what a blessing it was to have God's word. Right? Is God's word good? Can you give me an amen? Amen. The Bible, right? Not just the Old Testament, but the New Testament. Right? God's given this to us. You and I have a unique opportunity living in 2019. We have the scriptures exposed to us like never before. Right? But that's not the foundation. Right? That's a way to strengthen our faith. The foundation is that Jesus Christ was crucified and he rose again from the dead. He rose again from the dead. We need to keep it simple. Jesus rose from the dead. Last week, if you were with us, uh, we joined with those that have gone before us for the last couple thousand years when they were persecuted, when there were questions, when they had doubts themselves. You know what they would say out loud? He's risen. He's risen. You know what they would respond to each other? He's risen indeed, and then they would say, hallelujah, hallelujah. So how about we say that? I know it's not Easter Sunday right now, but every time we get together, right, we're built on this foundation. And so he's risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Please bow your heads and pray with me. Now God, on this side of eternity, um, Lord, you tell us that we see but as in a mirror. Well, there's always going to be clouds, there's always going to be storms, and that's just not outside of us, that's in us. And so we're always going to wrestle with our faith. Well, there's going to be questions, there's going to be things that come up that make us doubt. And so we confess in this moment, we believe, help us with our unbelief. We thank you for the gospel. We pray that we can always come back to that, that that is our foundation. That Jesus Christ was crucified and he rose again from the dead. It starts there and it ends there. We thank you for that. And we thank you for the scriptures that we have. Not just these 39 books in the Old Testament, but these 27 books in the New Testament. And we believe what those who have gone before us believe that these 66 books were inspired by you, that they're set apart, that you've written to us to strengthen our faith. Lord, you are a holy God and you are a gracious God. You are God. And so I do pray that we would always be mindful of that, that we would have great respect for you. We do acknowledge that you are our friend. You've shown us that in Jesus, but we know who you are. Lord, and when you're in your presence, Lord, we know that you are holy, that you are God and God alone, and we're always in your presence. Uh, Jesus, uh, you've taught us to value not just the scriptures, but also prayer. And you've taught us how to pray. And so we pray together as a community that prayer that you've taught us is up on the screen if you don't know it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.